Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, this is the uh, the penultimate lecture in this in this whole series of of lectures in biochemistry, and uh, everything we've kind of talked about so far has led us to this to this final two lectures on cellular respiration. Okay. So everything we've sort of learned so far, whether it be redox reactions, whether it be uh, proteins, whether it be carbohydrates or lipids. Um, whether it be enzymes, everything has led us to this to this point. Okay, and so what we're going to do really in this, um, so this is this is a, a, sort of a series of two lectures on cellular respiration, um, and it's, uh, to talk about cellular respiration uh, would be too much, uh, especially considering the, so, the, so, the number of things you have to learn to fit into one lecture, and that's why we split it into two. Okay, so first of all, we're just going to go over some of the basics of, of, of cellular respiration. Okay, what we mean by cellular respiration, okay, uh, especially in the context of it in the production of ATP. Okay, understand what ATP is and why it, why it uh, is such an energy rich molecule, why it's so useful. And also come back and look at electrons. Okay. Electrons play a pivotal role in uh, in this whole process of cellular respiration. So we're just going to look at electrons as well. Um, we're going to look at uh, we're going to relate redox reactions to cellular respiration. Okay, and then finish off by talking about other energy-rich molecules, other energy or electron-carrying molecules. Okay, so right then, so. First thing is what is cellular respiration? Okay, now often in biology this is confused with uh, breathing. So when when a clinician says, "Oh, let's check the person's resps," they're often referring to breathing. Okay, so I, although this although it's it's, it's linked, okay, uh, but respiration as it relates to breathing, okay, and and how it relates to cellular respiration are not the same. Although, like I said, they're linked. Okay. Respiration in the breathing sense refers to, you know, it refers to the exchange of gases, okay, oxygen with carbon dioxide, okay. Uh, but cellular respiration uh, in the chemistry sense and in the cellular sense, okay, refers to uh, the harvesting or the breaking up of food, especially, um, especially carbohydrates. Okay, harvesting some of the energy that's locked away in the uh, electron configurations of these molecules. Okay, the uh, uh, high energy electrons in these molecules to be passed on uh, in the cells through various enzymatic reactions. Okay, to produce ATP. So that's what cellular respiration refers to in the context we're going to talk about. Okay, but uh, just so that you know. Okay. Uh, respiration. When we talk about respiration, in the in the clinical sense, we're talking about breathing. Okay, and I say it's linked because without breathing, we can't uh, bring in oxygen, or we can't breathe out carbon dioxide, which cellular respiration uh, is critical with. Okay, so this is the um, cellular respiration equation here. Okay. Uh, breaking up of glucose so oxidizing glucose using oxygen okay so when we when we say oxidizing we're talking about uh, um, losing electrons okay so glucose as it, as it breaks as it breaks down it loses its high energy electrons and through a series of uh, reactions those electrons are passed those high energy electrons are passed down and eventually received by all oxygen molecular oxygen okay uh, which becomes really electronegative because it gains electrons. It then it reacts with hydrogen to form water. Okay, and the glucose is oxidized into carbon dioxide. Okay, so those these two are the sides and uh, the side products, the byproducts, if you like, the carbon dioxide and water. But the main purpose of oxidizing glucose is to harvest the energy from glucose, um, from the energy-rich electrons from glucose, to pass them on to make ATP. Okay, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the molecule which uh, which fuels, if you like, which gives energy to all the biochemical reactions that that need energy to take place in, in cells. 
Okay. Now, cellular respiration is in what we call an exergonic process. Another way you can say that it's also a catabolic process. Okay. So exergonic or catabolic process. Essentially, what we're doing is we're uh, breaking bonds, okay, which are obviously held by electrons. And we're using uh, those energy, the energy stored away, uh, stored in those electro elect electronic configurations uh, in, the, in those bonds, and using that energy to transfer, to, for it to be transferred to produce ATP. Okay, so it's an exergonic. So again, it's it's about terminology. So just make sure you know your terminology. Exergonic, catabolic, kind of mean the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> Cellular respiration, its purpose is to produce ATP, okay, and we produce up to 32, on average, about 32 molecules of ATP for every molecule of glucose we're able to break down, to, we're able to oxidize fully to carbon dioxide, <laughs> okay. Uh, now, the energy locked away in glucose the energy that we harvest to generate 32 molecules of ATP only uses up about 34% of the total energy in the uh, in the in the bonds that hold uh, glucose together, or hold those atoms that make up glucose together. Okay, so it only uses 30 34%. The other 66% uh, is lost, and it's lost as heat. Okay, so when when you ask the question, where does the rest go? Then you're obviously breaking it down. You're breaking glucose into the final product of carbon dioxide, but you're only harvesting 34% of the energy. Where does the rest go? Well, it it goes as heat. Okay, and the reason why we um, can generate heat is be, is because of the cellular respiration processes that go on in our cells. Okay. Although we produce, although we harvest 34% uh, of the energy, the other 66% goes away as heat, and that's how we generate heat. Okay. And the more, then it uh, it makes sense to understand that the more ATP we produce, the more glucose we broke down, break down. Okay. The more heat is produced. It's the reason why we get really warm uh, when we exercise. Okay. We're breaking up glucose, we're producing ATP, but we're also generating lots of heat, okay? Um, so there's lots of energy stored away in glucose. And like I mentioned in, 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 an, in an early lecture, okay, uh, we're, we're very fortunate that we have this process of cellular respiration, okay? If, if, if you were to take some glucose molecules, or some, so not just glucose, if you, if you were to take some sugar, which are essentially lots of glucose molecules, okay, and uh, apply, applied some heat to it, so provide some activation energy, if you like, provide some heat energy, okay, and then just wait for it, and then it'll suddenly explode. So a lot, so in other words, what 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 I'm basically saying is that the uh, the amount of energy that's released is is massive. Okay, so you put a little bit, so you put a little bit of heat energy in, and then what you get out of it, if you if you uh, combust it, you get a, an explosion of energy. Okay, and our bodies would never be able to cope with that. Okay, so that's why we break down uh, glucose in a stepwise manner. Okay, so that we release a little bit of the energy as we break the glucose molecule down stepwise. Okay. Uh, other foods can also be used. Uh, as a source of energy, okay. So, our primary source of of ATP generation is through the breakdown of is through the oxidation of of glucose. But fats can also be used, okay. Fats can also be used, and as well as proteins, okay. Uh, it's just that the processes, the process by which fats and proteins are used, is a uh, they're a bit different. At the end, they all enter the same pathway, okay. But as you'll see, there are there are three different pathways uh, to through uh, to, for cellular respiration, okay. And we're going to concentrate on the breakdown of glucose because that's that that's our that's our primary food source, 
okay so it's like i said okay uh, the breakdown the oxidation of glucose is a catabolic path a catabolic process okay so the production of atp from glucose is a cat catabolic process okay uh, catabolic can be exchanged with exergonic okay so catabolic basically means you're breaking things down okay and in the process of breaking it down you're you're releasing energy and exergonic this is what it basically means uh as you break things down heat energy is released okay or energy is released but normally it's in the form of heat okay aerobic respiration okay consumes organic molecules such as uh, um such as glucose okay and when we talk about organic molecules we're talking about it in the in the chemistry sense so anything made up of carbon is organic except carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide everything else that's made up of, made up made of carbon is organic okay so aerobic respiration by the uh, it through a catabolic process it's an s exergonic reaction because it releases energy it releases energy okay and that energy is, is used in aerobic respiration to fuel the synthesis of uh, atp okay which is the energy carrying molecule that we as uh, in our cells can use okay and oxygen is required for that because oxygen is the, uh, the final electron acceptor okay anaerobic respiration also known as fermentation okay is it's 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 a partial degradation of sugars okay so like i said before uh, there are three pathways okay uh, when it comes to the cellular respiration and we'll talk about those pathways uh, in, in later on in this lecture, but also in more detail in the next lecture. Okay. So, anaerobic respiration, fermentation. Um, it's basically it's basically a partial degradation of sugars. Okay. So it's not a complete oxidation of 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 glucose to yield it to yield the maximum number of ATP molecules. Okay. It's a partial oxidation of of sugars. Okay, and you'll see what I mean by that in in, in a later slide. Uh, because we require oxygen to fully to allow for full oxidation of sugars, and if oxygen is absent, okay, we can't uh, fully oxidize the sugars, and hence whatever whatever partial oxidation occurs, okay, the uh, resulting product is pyruvate and that is that then is fermented and to become pyruvate to become lactic acid okay uh, so because you can't uh, so because you can't fully oxidize it you're not producing the maximum number of atp molecules so um, you can still produce atp okay through anaerobic respiration but the number is massively less okay so with as an example the uh, the number of molecules of atp you produce with through full oxidation of sugars is about 32 molecules of atp okay uh, through um anaerobic respiration you're only producing two molecules of atp okay and that two molecules of atp can be important okay just it can be about it can be important but it also is very important because it keeps the cells ticking along whilst uh, more uh, sort of a, a better supply of oxygen comes along okay so usually what happens is that uh, the rate of atp synthesis okay is 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 ma is huge but if you're not breathing enough oxygen the rate of in the, the rate of atp synthesis decreases it backlogs okay and it's that that leads to anaerobic respiration it's there's simply not enough o2 being supplied to the cells to carry out full oxidation of glucose okay and so that that leads to lactic acid production and acid is uh, is a pain stimulant hence the reason why you get muscle pains when you get lactic acid formation okay now these are the three main cycles okay in um in the uh, oxidation the full oxidation of glucose okay like i said it's a catabolic uh, pathway so it breaks 
it uh, it refers to uh, it relates to breaking uh, g glucose down. Okay. Now the three pathways are glycolysis, the TCA cycle, or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Okay. And then the final pathway, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. Okay. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, whereas the TCA cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation pathway happens in the mitochondria. Glycolysis happens in all cells, okay, and so does TCA cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, but only where there's mitochondria present. Now, the reason why I say that is because not all cells, 99.9% will of cells will have mitochondria, but there are, there's one one cell type which doesn't, and that's the red blood cells. Okay, red blood cells only uh, are absent of mitochondria, so they can't perform the TCA cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation cycle pathway, they can only undergo glycolysis. And what did I mention in the previous slide? Glycolysis only leads to the production of two ATP molecules. Okay. But that is sufficient for those cells. Okay. It's sufficient for those cells to carry out whatever biochemical reactions they need to carry out. Okay. And their their sort of uh, um, uh, <coughs> red blood cells carry out s specific uh, reactions, okay, but not the multitude of different reactions that every other cell uh, undertakes, okay, and so for that reason, although the biochemical reactions that happen in red blood cells are quite big, okay, but they're they're nowhere near as big uh, that of other cells, okay. Hence the reason why two ATP um, molecules in red blood blood red blood in red blood cells is sufficient to carry out all the biochemical processes that happen in red blood cells. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just find out what the cursor is. There it is. Okay, so glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm, okay. whereas the TCA cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation pathway happen in the mitochondria. Okay, and this is where most of the ATP is produced. Okay, like I said. For every for for complete oxidation, you're producing around 32 molecules of ATP. You only produce two molecules of ATP in glycolysis, so the other 30 must come from here. Okay, and that's, that, that that is indeed true. We get most of the ATP production in this actually in the last pathway, oxidative phosphorylation pathway. This is where we we get the vast majority of ATP production. Okay, the other two cycles are. Um, responsible for generating very important molecules that are needed for oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, and we'll come on to that in a, in a in a in a later slide. Okay. Now, so this is the uh, <clears throat> this is the cellular respiration pathway or the uh, the equation. Okay, so glucose. That's the um, chemical formula for glucose, C6H12O6. Okay, lots of carbon-hydrogen bonds. Okay. Okay. Uh, oxygen to oxidize glucose to help to oxidize glucose because it acts as the final elect electron acceptor to produce um, carbon dioxide, water, and heat. Okay, and ATP, and that's the energy that is. Uh, generated as we oxidize glucose, okay, as well as the side product or the byproducts, the waste products, if you like, um, water and carbon dioxide. Okay, now the easiest fuel we use are carbohydrates. Okay, it's a bit more difficult to use fats and proteins. Okay, um, fats. Can be used. Um, it, actually, let me let me let me just go back a second. Fats can be uh, are used uh, sometimes at the same time as carbohydrates. So at any given moment, you're not just using carbohydrates. Okay, you're also using fats as well. Okay, but the vast majority of the energy at any one moment actually is using carbohydrates. Okay, uh, fats can be used as well. Uh, but at a much lower, it's only when you run out of carbohydrates, when you run out of glycogen, okay, and then we can use fats. 
Okay. And in the absence of fats, we can also use proteins. Okay. Okay, so like I was saying before, okay, um, the free energy or the amount of energy, okay. So if you look at the uh, uh, the energy in sugar, the free energy in sugar and the free energy of carbon dioxide, okay, there's a, there's a lot more free energy in sugar than there is in carbon dioxide, and so that so if you were to put an initial um, amount of energy to activate the sugar in order for that energy to be released okay so you need a little bit of activation energy and then you get this massive uh yield of energy okay so like uh, and before as we sort of said before um if it wasn't for if it wasn't for cellular respiration uh, the energy would be all lost as and our bodies would not be able to cope with that huge uh release of heat energy okay our temperatures would suddenly go up okay and it's and, it, and it's because of cellular respiration that we're able to break down sh sugar but in a stepwise manner so this represents the the different enzymes in cellular respiration that result in the ox you know the, the the stepwise oxidation and as you oxidize it, you release a bit of energy, more energy, more energy here, more energy here. And all this energy is that is carried down. Okay. You start off with uh, high energy electrons, eventually leading to low energy electrons. Okay. And these low energy electrons are then carried by uh, oxygen to produce water. Okay. Now, again, just to uh, reiterate the point that I was making before in the previous lecture, Okay, the oxidation of glucose to, uh, to carbon dioxide is a spontaneous reaction. Okay, so the free energy in sugar is a lot higher than the product, so this is a spontaneous reaction. It's just that you need to put energy in before the reaction can proceed quickly. Okay, so this reaction will happen regardless. It's, uh, it's just that with enzymes, we can we can uh, we can speed up this process by lowering the activation energy. Okay. But also do it in a in a stepwise manner. Okay, so the energy is released slowly. Okay, enough for us to cope with. So if you remember in in the enzymes lecture, we talked about uh, entropy. Okay, now I was saying in in that lecture that um, the universe, so the laws of physics dictate that uh, the universe reaches high entropy. So lots of disorder in in in, uh, in molecules and atoms. Okay. Now we as human beings, okay, are packets of concentrated energy. Okay. We build all kinds of um, all kinds of molecules, all kinds of substances okay all kinds of structures uh, so we have skin nails bones um, all kinds of complicated uh, structures okay now to build those structures you need to put energy in and the universe doesn't like that okay so to man maintain ourselves in these highly concentrated packets of energy okay we need to put energy in and this is where ATP comes in then. Okay. ATP is the energy carrying molecule uh, which our biochemical processes can use to build okay, to build molecules. Okay, from amino acids to proteins, from from uh, um, from sugars to carbohydrates, from lipids to fats, okay, and then to even more even more complex structures. Okay, like bone and skin. Okay, all these require energy. Okay, and it's this ATP that does that provides this energy. Okay. <clears throat> now, the the major currency of energy is ATP. Okay, but there are other energy-rich molecules. Okay, energy-rich molecules such as NADH and FADH two. Okay, these are what we call electron carrying molecules in the context of cellular respiration okay um, 
so if I, if I just go back one slide before, can you see over here? Okay, where we're oxidizing uh, the glucose molecule, so we're basically extracting high energy electrons. Okay, and eventually we get low energy electrons. Okay, and it's these molecules here, NAD, NAD, and FAD, FADH, that carry that allow for the carrying of these high energy electrons. So they themselves are energy rich molecules because they carry high energy electrons, okay, which are passed from the oxid oxidation of, of glucose. Okay. Uh, another word that I wanted to mention was anabolic. Okay. Whereas catabolic before we talked about was the breaking up of something. Okay, breaking up of molecules to release uh, energy. Anabolic is the opposite. Okay, so it's the building up of molecules. So if we if we talk about amino acids being joined together to produce proteins, that's an anabolic process. Okay, so it requires energy. Okay. So you may have heard of anabolic steroids, for example. Okay, so these steroids which speed up the production of of muscle. Okay. <clears throat> Right then. Okay. So this is um, this is ATP. This is the structure of ATP. You can see we've, we've seen this we've seen this before when we talked about nucleotides and DNA and RNA in a previous lecture, and I showed you um, this slide before. Okay. But uh, I'll show it again, and I just want to relate how similar it is to DNA. So if you look at DNA, you've got a nitrogenous base, an adenine. We've got a sugar. Okay. Um, we've got a phosphate group. Uh, what do we have for ATP? It's, this, it's very similar. An adenine, again, a ribose. But instead of having one phosphate group, as in DNA, you have three phosphate groups. Okay. Now, I've mentioned this before, but if you look at uh, the number of oxygens present in this, in this close proximity of space, to hold that together, okay, uh, it requires a lot of energy. Okay, you can you can think of these as as almost like a spring, a coiled spring. So it's just bursting to 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 spring open. So it's bursting with energy. To hold these oxygens in in close proximity requires a lot of energy. Okay, so this is where we actually store the energy. So when we take the high energy electrons from glucose, okay, that energy is then used to synthesize ATP. So it'll start off as AMP, okay? So AMP, adenosine monophosphate, just one phosphate, and then through uh, <coughs> um, through the transfer of high energy electrons, we can use that energy to build adenosine diphosphate and then adenosine triphosphate, okay? It doesn't always have to go through that process, AMP to ADP to ATP, sometimes, uh, there's lots of ADP present, okay? ADP, so adenosine diphosphate. You just need a little bit of, not, not a little bit, but some energy from oxidation of glucose to add this final phosphate group, okay? And this is when you really have a. This is when it. This this is when this molecule contains the highest uh, energy levels, <coughs> okay? And it's this bond here, really. So it's this it's this uh, interaction of this phosphate group with this phosphate group through th through the shedding of electrons over here, okay? And it's really the shedding of electrons at this point that carry most of the energy that most of the useful energy uh, to drive biochemical processes. Okay. So just to illustrate the point again, that um, um, the free energy of ATP will spontaneously uh, degrade, react to produce ADP because the free energy of ATP is so much higher than ADP. Okay, so this reaction will happen regardless. Okay, um, but we can speed up the process by enzymes which harvest, which take the energy uh, from ATP. To, to drive biochemical processes, leaving you 
with the product of ADP. Okay, so ADP has a much lower free energy available energy than ATP does. So this reaction is spontaneous, but with this with the help of enzymes, we can uh, lower the activation energy. Okay, to make this process much quicker. Okay, again, it's an hexagonic process. Okay, so we can we we take some of the energy from ATP to produce uh, to to come up to produce the product ADP, but in the process. You're also producing heat as well. Okay, so it's an hexagonic process. Okay. If I just go back for a second, uh, let me just show you again that we need to put to, in, in order to harvest the energy locked away in ATP, uh, we need to activate the molecule. Okay, so put some energy in. And so that's the activation energy, and then we can speed it up because enzymes lower the activation energy. Now, if you look at the enzyme, the enzyme responsible for breaking down ATP to ADP. Okay, so imagine this is a this is a huge enzyme. Okay, now this just represents the active site of the enzyme here. Okay, uh, there's the adenosine. There's those are the three phosphates. Okay, and we need to break, we need to extract this phosphate here, okay, the energy locked away in this phosphate, and transfer it to something like, say, a molecule of glucose. Okay, so the first thing is, how, the, how do we <clears throat> break this bond here? Okay, well, we need to put some energy in, but the, uh, the catalytic site of the, of the, um, <clears throat> of, of the enzyme, that breaks down the ATP, holds ATP in a position that it's able to distort this bond much easier. <clears throat> okay. Now, the way we can do this is by, first what we need to do is we need to sort of shield these very electronegative oxygens. Okay. In order to, in order to distort this even more, we need, to dis, we need to hold on to these oxygens, okay, to hold them together. So in the active side, what you'll find is that you'll find lots of electropositive charges. Okay, so there's a, there's an amino group here, <clears throat> here, a positive charge, the magnesium. Okay, uh, which is used to shield these two electronegative oxygens, and once you have that, you hold it in a position. The the catalytic side can hold adenosine a triphosphate in a position that it's able to distort this bond much easier. Okay, so if you if you hold uh, the electrons here <clears throat> into position, or you shield these electrons here, okay, um, the electrons from here then, okay, from this bond, become destabilized and get transferred, okay, or or the electrons here then tend to move to this to this electronegative oxygen here, okay. <clears throat> Once you do that, uh, this becomes positively charged. Okay, and that can be nucleophilically attacked by any other molecule which has a which has a, a a negative charge here. Okay, so that could be an OH group. Okay, um, OH group from from a sugar, for example, from from a glucose molecule. Okay, and once you do that, okay, that phos that bond breaks, and this phosphate that is free to be bound to this molecule here and this is what we get then so this rx this rx here plus the addition of the phosphate group here okay now if this is if this is a sugar molecule if this is a sugar molecule like, like a glucose molecule okay let's say this is a glucose molecule you've got this extra phosphate group now again lots of electronegative oxygens attached to to the glucose molecule when you have all these electronegative oxygens attached to a glucose molecule, it destabilizes the glucose molecule, and and it helps the glucose molecule then to be broken down much easier. Okay, uh, another thing, another bit of terminology that I wanted to just just mention here is the word phosphorylated. Okay, this is a phosphate group. So when you add a phosphate group to something, so in this case, um, let's say this is a sugar. This phosphate group is attached. It's it's broken up, broken off from adenosine triphosphate. Okay, that phosphate group is then attached to the um, <clears throat> to the sugar. Okay, so this represents a sugar here. 
Okay, so you've got all this <coughs> electronegative oxygen, all this energy then uh, being attached to the sugar. Okay, as you at, as you attach a phosphate group, we say that the sugar then is phosphorylated. Okay, phosphorylated, and there are the the enzymes which mediate these phosphorylation reactions are called kinases. Now we're going to come back to kinases later on. Okay. So this is what you left what left off with then. So you're left with uh, the sugar molecule, which is phosphorylated. Okay, and through this phosphorylation, the sugar molecule becomes destabilized, and that that can then undergo further cellular, further oxidation. Okay, and as as far as the ATP is concerned, one of the one of the phosphates has come off, so you're left with two phosphates now. So you're left with adenosine diphosphate. So just to illustrate that, just to illustrate the point that I was making before, okay, in the previous slide, okay, this is hexokinase. So this is the first enzyme in the in the gly gly glycolysis pathway, okay. So like I said, it's a kinase, so it's an enzyme which phosphorylates, okay. So in this case, this hexokinase phosphorylates a glucose molecule. So here's a glucose molecule, and we've added a phosphate group. So this hexokinase has phosphorylated this glucose molecule. Okay, and how and again, it's the same process in the active site of hexokinase. What you have is lots of magnesium, not lots of magnesium, but you have magnesium. Okay, you have other um, uh, other amino acids which uh, have an and have an electropositive charge, hence their ability to shield these these oxygens. Okay, in order for this 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 phosphate uh, this this bond to be broken or to destabilize the electrons here. Okay, so that we can add this phosphate group to the to the glucose. Okay, so um, so hexokinase, okay, is able to phosphorylate glucose. So as soon as you have a phosphate group, now you've got this extra phosphate group here. You've got all these oxygens present in this in this very close proximity. All of them are electronegative. Okay, just 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 bundled with uh, springing with. Or, or, or bursting with energy, okay, and it's this energy here that destabilizes the glucose molecule, okay. Uh, so this hexokinase, let's just take a step back. Um, this hexokinase uses ATP, okay. So in in the active side of the enzyme, okay, it uses it, it brings in ATP, ATP comes in, and hexokinase takes off this phosphate group. But specifically adds it to a glucose molecule, okay? Or we 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 refer to it as a hexo, so any six carbon sugar. So this is a six carbon sugar. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, six carbon sugar. So it could be a fructose as well. It doesn't have to be a glucose. Just a bit of repetition here, just to ha hammer down the point that ATP, okay, is is a is produced through a process called cellular respiration. Now it's a catabolic process, like we said before. So it's it's breaking up of of glucose. Okay, so this is a catabolic process, but the whole pro the whole point of cellular respiration is to make ATP, and ATP is an anabolic process. Okay, so this is what we call a coupled uh, reaction. Okay. Uh, catabolic in terms of breaking down glucose, and then anabolic in terms of building up uh, ADP to produce ATP. Okay, so it's a coupled. Uh, it's, it's an example of a coupled reaction. Okay, uh, in order to oxidize sugar completely, we need. So this is a bit of a summary. We need glycolysis. We need the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the TCA cycle, also known as the citric acid or the Krebs cycle. Okay, and and then. This final pathway, oxidative phosphorylation, called the electron transport. Okay, so it's basically carrying high energy electrons uh, through a series of proteins uh, to be delivered at the end to molecular oxygen to produce water. Okay, and as as the high energy electrons are carried from one protein to another in oxidative phosphorylation, okay, the energy is harvested to produce eventually um, ATP. Okay. Okay. So again, a bit of repetition here. Okay. So 
Oops. Let's go back. So, in eukaryotes, look at, so we are eukaryotic organisms, okay, uh, as opposed to prokaryotic, which are bacteria, okay. Uh, so again, so this is just to summarize. So in eukaryotes, we harvest energy from food. Okay, so we're taking uh, high energy electrons. Okay, um, from carbon hydrogen bonds to yield large amounts of ATP. Okay, and it's this ATP that is used in our cells to do cellular work. Okay, so. Glucose is broken down to CO2 and water, and the cell captures some of the, you know, 34% of the released energy to make ATP. The other 66% goes away as heat, is lost as heat. Okay. <clears throat> and cellular respiration takes mostly the, at least the very, the, the high ATP pro producing elements of cellular respiration take place in the mitochondria. Okay. Now, I keep talking about um, high energy electrons. Okay, uh, electrons exist in energy levels. Okay, so if you look, if you, th if you think of this as the nucleus and these are the energy levels, okay, it's a lot more complex than this, but let's just keep it simple. They exist in energy levels. Okay, the closer the electrons are to the nucleus, the lower the energy. Okay, uh, if you want to move the electrons further away from the nucleus, Okay, you need to put energy in. So electrons that exist on outer shells will have higher energy. Okay, and so if you put energy in into the electrons, the electrons can then jump to higher energy levels. Okay, so people you, you may often you may have heard about the the principle of photons. Photons carry energy. So if you have a certain photon hitting electrons, the electrons can then jump to a higher energy level. And then, as the as the electrons fall back to the um, as as they fall back to the lower energy level, they release. So the photon that hit them, okay, that photon then is released, and we can see that as light, okay. So when we when we when we when we see these um, uh, these really alien-like creatures fluorescing in the deep uh, deep oceans, okay, this is what they're doing, okay. They're putting energy in. Okay, uh, in this fluorescing molecule, they put energy in, and then they, as the electrons fall, they release the energy, and that 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 energy is 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 released as photons, as light. Okay, now obviously we're we're not. Okay, so <clears throat> in in our, in our cells, um, we uh, when when we break down sugars. Okay, those electrons uh, that make up the carbon hydrogen bonds. They exist in higher energy levels, hence the reason why they why they contain high energies or high energy electrons. Okay, because the electrons exist in high energy levels. Okay, and it's this. So as the electron falls to lower energy levels, okay, it's this energy we capture to produce ATP. That is this energy we capture to drive the formation of ATP. Okay. Now, when we talk about um, Carbon hydrogen bonds. If you look at the electronegativity table, if you okay, if if you guys if you ever got some time, look look at the periodic table, okay. And the further right you go to the further right to the top you go, okay, the more electronegative the uh, the atoms become, okay. So fluorine, for example, is more electronegative than oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. Nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. But then look at carbon and hydrogen, 2.5 to 2.1. This represents, uh, you know, almost equal. Okay, so they're not too dissimilar in terms of the electronegativity. Okay, so electrons, because um, in, in the case of oxygen, okay, if you, if you had oxygen and, and hydrogen to make up water, okay, um, oxygen and hydrogen, okay, two point one to three point five. Now, oxygen oxygen is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen is, so electrons tend to spend more time around the oxygen. But when we talk about carbon-hydrogen bonds, okay, their electronegativity is very similar, although carbon is a bit more. Um, electrons then tend to not congregate more towards the carbon, but they tend to congregate in the middle. Okay, so because they congregate, so because 
carbon doesn't really have a monopoly uh, of, of on the electrons compared to hydrogen. Okay, the, uh, the the covalent bond that makes up carbon hydrogen bonds, okay, the electrons are kind of sort of uh, sort of halfway house. Okay, so they 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 share their electrons equally almost. Okay, and because of that, it's difficult to break these bonds. Okay, so these these electrons actually carry high energy because you need. To, uh, it's difficult to break those bonds. It's easier to break down to break oxygen um, and hydrogen bonds. Okay, because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Okay, so oxygens will will hold on to the electrons much more tighter than than hydrogens are. So theoretically, it's it's, it's easier. Okay, but carbon hydrogens are much more difficult. Okay, so carbon hydrogens have high energy electrons. Okay. So, like I said, uh, glucose is mostly made up of carbon hydrogens. Okay, carbon hydrogens, um, and these have high energy electrons. Okay, uh, whereas carbon di carbon uh, C O bonds have low energy electrons. Okay, carbon oxygen have low energy electrons. Um, so, when we talk about carbon dioxide, uh, the electrons here will have low energy electrons, whereas carbon hydrogen will have high energy electrons. Okay, and it's this high energy electrons, the energy in these high energy electrons that is that is captured, harvested to produce, uh, to synthesize ATP or to build ATP. Okay, um, and then what we're left with at the end are low energy electrons, which are which is then captured by molecular oxygen to produce water okay this is not water this is carbon dioxide okay it's just that what we're left with once once this, once this has been broken down oxidized completely we're left with this here carbon dioxide right Okay. Again, bit of rip, bit of repetition here. It's just this this dem this demonstrates here the electron transport chain mostly. Okay. So we know that these high energy electrons they start off high energy with lots of free energy. Okay. And then uh, as the energy is captured to to produce ATP. Okay. Um, less than these energy these electrons have then uh, result in lower energy. Okay. Lower energy. They react with oxygen that we breathe. Okay, the oxygen becomes electronegative because it gains electrons. Okay, um, because it's electronegative, it reacts with the hydrogens which are in abundance in the mitochondria to produce water. Okay, so the whole thing is quite elegant, uh, and it's relative, you know, relatively speaking, it's very efficient as well to capture thirty-four percent of the energies. It's quite, it's quite inefficient when we when we when we think about mechanical processes. Okay, thirty-four percent is quite efficient. To bring the whole process back to where we started, so initially we started in the first lecture. We talked about redox reactions. Okay, so just to link the whole thing together, this whole process of uh, cellular respiration is a series of redox reactions. Okay, because what what are we dealing with? We're dealing with electrons, and what is redox? Okay, reduction. Uh, oil, um, oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, okay, and uh, and um, reduction is the gain of electrons, okay. So uh, glucose is oxidized, so basically we're losing high energy electrons, okay, and in the process some other molecule is being reduced, so it's gaining those high energy electrons, okay. Um, and those molecules are molecules in the uh, such as NAD and FAD. Okay, so just to reiterate that point, then that the whole process of cellular respiration is a series of redox reactions: glucose being oxidized and other molecules being reduced. Okay. Okay. So here we are, a bit of repetition again. Okay, glucose is oxidized. Okay, it loses 
uh, it loses its electrons. And in biology, when we, when we, when we talk about losing electrons uh, in biological terms, so when we say losing electrons, we're talking through um, in chemical terms, but but in biological terms, as we lose electrons, okay, at the same time, we're also uh, losing hydrogens, okay. Because in biological systems, it's the electrons which hold, which enable for hydrogen to bind to, to biological molecules. Okay, so if you lose electrons, you get a loss of hydrogens as well. Okay, so oxidation could be defined as um, a loss of electrons, but also a loss of hydrogens. Okay. <clears throat> so glucose is oxidized to form carbon dioxide and oxygen is reduced okay to form so those hydrogens which are lost not 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 exactly the same ones but those hydrogens which are lost at some point okay are used to generate water molecules okay and these numbers here it basically means uh, if you, if you haven't done chemistry these numbers are important because it it uh, it ensures that the whole reaction is balanced okay so we have six carbons here on this side six carbons on this side okay 12 carbons here and we have six times two 12 car 12 sorry hydrogens 12 hydrogens six times two 12 hydrogens okay six times okay so six times two 12 oxygens plus six oxygens here so it's 18 oxygens on this side and then on this side we have six times two 12 oxygens plus six oxygens here 18 so these numbers are just to represent um equality in the in the in the reaction because we, we can't just you can't just produce six molecules of carbon dioxide if you only have a molecule of oxygen okay um so it has to be balanced right then okay so we have a limited amount of ATP in our cells. Okay, so when we, when we when we look at a particular any human being, we're limited to about a hundred grams of ATP. Okay, so if we if you take all the ATP from all our cells, it would amount to a hundred grams. Okay, now when you think about it, okay, we use up, okay, we use up around forty kilograms of ATP per day okay now once atp is formed we can we use it within a minute at rest okay so what what i'm trying to say here is that the amount of atp we use is way way beyond the total amount of 100 grams that we have in our bodies okay for a two-hour run for example we would need 60 kilograms of ATP so 60 kilograms of ATP is consumed now obviously we don't have 60 kilograms of ATP so what what we need to understand is that ATP is constantly being turned over or not turned over turned over okay ATP is constantly being turned over okay so this hundred grams of ATP is constantly being recycled Okay, so when people talk about ATP being a bit like a, a rechargeable battery, we're constantly having to recharge AT, a, a, ADP to produce ATP. Okay, so because we need to recharge it, we need energy for that, don't we? Okay, so to regenerate ADP, so once ATP is used up, we get, we, you, so one of the phosphate comes off, Okay, so it goes from ATP to ADP, and that ADP then needs to be recharged to become ATP again. Okay, I, in order for that to happen, we need to put energy in. And so the oxidation of glucose, okay, to, to generate ATP from ADP is critical because we need a constant amount of, of, we need constantly lots of ATP being turned over at any given moment because we use it so quickly okay and it's the cellular respiration that provides this energy that allows us to regenerate adp to produce atp okay so cellular respiration is critical um because we only have a limited amount of atp in our in our in our bodies 
Okay. So energy is put in. Okay. ADP to form AD, ATP. So energy. So it's so the whole cellular respiration pathway is hexagonic. So we're uh, we're uh, extracting the he, uh, energy from glucose. That energy that's extra, that's that's uh, extracted by the of the breakdown of glucose is then harvested to regenerate ADP to ATP. Okay, and then ATP is used up in the multitude of biochemical process reactions that need to happen in every cell. Okay, now ATP is one very energy rich molecule. Okay, but there are others. Okay, other energy rich molecules. Um, in order to produce uh, ATP at the end, okay, what we do need is um, molecules which can carry these high energy electrons. Okay, so as glucose is being oxidized and these high energy electrons are being released, okay, we need molecules to be able to carry those high energy electrons. And it's these molecules here, NAD, NAD nicotinamide adenine, adenine dinucleotide, okay, uh, this is one of the molecules that is able to carry electrons, high energy electrons. Okay, and what do we say? If you if you if you um, um, if you gain an electron, you gain a hydrogen. If you if you lose an electron, you lose a hydrogen. Okay, so NAD by gaining the, an electron becomes NADH. Okay, uh, so this molecule here is it's extremely important. It's an it's an important coenzyme. Okay, in oxidizing glucose. It accepts electrons and becomes reduced to NADH. It's this portion of NAD, NAD that carries this high energy electrons or high energy electron. Okay, so as soon as you get an electron, okay, uh, we get the addition of, of a hydrogen as well. Okay, to produce uh, uh, two hydrogens here. Sometimes NADH is sometimes referred to as NADH2 because there's two hydrogens. Okay, but uh, um, NADH and NADH2 is the same thing. Okay, it's just it's just that it exists as NADH to begin with. So when we say NAD NAD plus, it's actually NADH because it has one H. Uh, but then when it gets another hydrogen through the addition of of these electrons. We get NADH, okay, but sometimes called NADH2 because there are two hydrogens. Okay, so uh, in textbooks, sometimes you'll see NADH with a little two at the end. Okay, so this is this is what it looks like. Okay, there you have the uh, the two hydrogens. Okay. Right then. Uh, a bit more about NAD to NADH. Okay, um, so the electrons that we um, extract from glucose, those are passed on to NAD. Okay, now NAD is also considered a coenzyme. Now, what is a coenzyme? It's a, it's a non protein molecule, it's not usually organic, so it's made, made up of carbon, which is required. By some enzymes to become active. Okay, so some so NAD is a a, a, a very important coenzyme, a, a product that is required by some enzymes for them to be active. Okay, so <clears throat> NAD once it collects the electrons, okay, it gets the addition of a hydrogen to become NADH. Okay, now as an electron acceptor, okay, NAD actually functions as an oxidizing agent. Okay, an oxidizing agent. What's, what's, oxidi what's oxidation? Okay, it's um, loss of electrons. So anything that facilitates the loss of electrons is what we call an oxidizing agent. Okay, um, NAD. Okay, it facilitates the loss of the electrons of something else. Okay, so it it accepts it. It, it accepts electrons to become reduced, but it itself is an oxidizing agent. Um, another way we could think about NADH is that because it contains high energy electrons, okay, 
uh, it contains lots of energy. Okay. The thing is, uh, your biochemical processes that exist in cells don't really use the energy trapped in NADH, but they they want to exploit the energy trapped in ATP. So that energy that's trapped in NADH is then used to synthesize ATP. And you know we'll talk about NADH and and other and another energy rich molecule FADH um, in in the next lecture. Okay. Okay. Again. I'm just summarizing uh, bits of what what the next lecture will talk about. Okay, about how NADH is used because it carries the high energy electrons. It passes those electrons to the electron transport chain. So when we talk about the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, okay, we're talking about the electron transport chain. Okay, and because we're we're passing it from one molecule to the next, to the next, to the next. Okay, we're sort of uh, extracting the energy in a stepwise way. Okay, if it wasn't the case, then the whole thing would be quite explosive. Okay. And oxygen pulls the f uh, the final low energy electrons. Okay, uh, to yield um, water at the end. Okay, and as the energy tumbles down in this electron transport chain, that energy is then used to regenerate ADP to produce ATP. Okay. Or just regenerate ATP. Okay. Again, just a bit of just to illustrate that point here. NAD. Okay. Uh, accepts high energy electrons. Okay. Um, that then those electrons, high energy electrons, are then are then passed on to the electron transport chain, and as the high energy electrons tumble down the pathway, they release the energy, and that energy is harvested. To, produce, to re regenerate ATP, and then the high energy electrons become low energy electrons. Okay, it reacts with uh, water. Sorry, oxygen. Okay, half is there just to just to balance the equation. Okay, uh, you don't really have half a molecule of oxygen, uh, molecular oxygen. It's just uh, a half a molar. Okay, so th this um, this this molecular oxygen accepts the final electronegative oxygen, uh, electrons rather, okay, um, and once the oxygen accepts these electrons, it becomes more electronegatively charged, which enables it to then uh, react with hydrogen, okay, to form water, okay, so like NAD, uh, there, there is there are there is one other very important electron carrying molecule and that's FAD. Okay, and once it carries its electrons, high energy electrons, it becomes FADH2. Okay, so FAD just oxidize, and then you get the addition of the hydrogens at at this point here and this point here. Okay, so to become FADH2. Okay, so this bit over here is just just it's just showing you this part. Okay, but the the whole molecule is quite big. Okay, so again, we'll talk about FAD and FADH2 uh, in in a bit more detail when we talk when we talk in the next lecture about the different stages of cellular respiration. Okay, it's basically these electrons here that uh, allow for these hydrogens to to react with. Uh, it's these electrons here which are the which are again the high energy electrons. Okay, so anyway, I think that's about it now. So it's just a few questions for you to have a go at. Uh, you can do this in your, in your own time. Okay, I'm just going to skip through this. So just bear with me for a second. Okay. Okay, so there we are. That's the end. Okay, so it wasn't too painful. And there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot to go through, but... Hopefully you can see that we've been through all of these learning outcomes now. Okay, we've, we've, we've talked about cellular respiration in, in a bit of detail now. Okay, uh, we've looked at um, uh, the production of ATP, what ATP is. Okay, what makes ATP rich in energy? About the three phosphates, about the final phosphate uh, carrying most of the energy. Okay, and how this final phosphate is then added to glucose to destabilize glucose to enable 
the breakdown of glucose, okay, to break down, to allow for cellular respiration. Okay, we looked at the role of electrons as well to, to, uh, to some extent. Uh, I would have liked to, to talk deeper about this, but uh, we might do this at some other time. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, and looked at, and then we've managed, we were able to link what we talked about in the beginning about redox reactions and linking that to the cellular respiration and explain how cellular respiration is just a series of redox reactions. Okay. And then we touched upon other energy rich molecules. And it's not just ATP, but also FAD and NADH. Okay. Or FADH2 and NADH. Okay. So I think that's about it. So the next lecture will be, will be, will be going into a bit more detail about the different stages of cellular respiration okay so uh, until then all the best stay safe as always and until next time okay bye bye